know where you are from and how we best can pray for you. Uh, we are a church that loves to pray so much so that we built a separate structure just for that very, very reason. And um, this morning we got a prayer out of our prayer shed and it simply says, please pray for my son. Please pray my son Owen starts talking. And I am assuming that that means there's um, maybe some developmental delays. And also pray for my mama to be strong. Amen. So when the bell quits ringing, we will, make, we will pray. <laughs> If you would, lift up your hands for this prayer. Father God, you know the one that, that took the time to stop and honor us with a prayer. Um, it's not easy to ask for prayer, especially from a stranger. So, Father, for the courage this person had to leave this in our hands. We now put this prayer request at the foot of the cross. You know the needs, you know the people, and we know that you will bless them. And we claim healing, and we claim progression for little Owen. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, amen. One of these days, my hair is going to catch on fire, leaning over, putting prayers in the prayer box. We're going to have to go down and call a volunteer fire department. So the first thing that I want to announce this morning is I want to give a big thanks. I'm not going to attempt to say your last name to Heather Ruska. Ruska. So just leave the H off. Okay, I can do that. <laughs> Heather Ruska, um, she... Through from a friend to a friend to a friend, and um, then we got to talking, and we found out that we're probably friends because we know a lot of the same people, and uh, we just do appreciate making. It was a 40-mile journey for her to get here today, and we really, really appreciate um, your willingness and your your heart for Jesus to come and play for the little church in the village. And we might be little, but we are kingdom builders, so we. We, we thank you for blessing our worship service this morning. Um, every, the reason she is here, as you all know, is Carolyn cannot be here. And I've been in touch with her all week. I've tried to keep at least the prayer group um, updated. I had a long, good conversation with her yesterday. Friday, I was, well, Becky Hamill and Luann and I, we were all ready to take her to the ER on Friday. Um, it was just really bad. And Becky and Luann stayed with her all day. Um, her Uncle Zeb came over and things calmed down. And yesterday when I talked with her, she really was much better. She is going to see um, a doctor, not her doctor, but a doctor in her clinic on Monday. And we're hoping that, um, we're hoping they're gonna find something simple that's fixable and um, that she will soon be back with us. Um, and then she's got an appointment in a couple of weeks with a, a neurologist. So if we just, I know you all are praying for Carolyn and I'm trying to keep everybody updated as best that I can. Um, it, it's serious, but, but, but I told her yesterday, I said, Carolyn, I'm claiming it's gonna be simple that you've just got serious symptoms and this is going to be a simple fix. So if you would all, when you pray for her, if you will join me in that prayer that as serious as her symptoms are, it's going to be simple. And when the doctors see her, it's going to be a simple fix. And we'll have our sweet Carolyn back real soon. Um, the I had another thing I wanted to say. Don't forget that this is our month to collect for the uh, for our food pantry. And um, if you have not gotten the, the uh, bulletin insert I had a few weeks ago, they're back there beside the bulletins with the Wednesday noontime um, Lent, Lent services that are, that are going on throughout our community. And Darius, could you put a couple of those in your store? Just pick up maybe 10 of them and take them and put them in your store. Okay, thanks. I meant to ask you that last week. And, 
I was everywhere, all over the place. And we do want to say welcome back, Debbie. And you're walking, and this is so great. So we are looking at answered prayers here. Uh, on, on the back of your, your bulletin, you will see her, Debbie Cole, on the prayer list. Well, this is Debbie. <laughs> she's, she's back, and um, are you, I'm guessing you're feeling better. So they did get a date. Okay. Okay. Well, you just... I'm sure about the date, but I mean, they're pretty far out. Right, right. Okay. Well, uh, just send me the details on that, and I'll keep everybody posted. But it is so good to see your face here today. Um, does anybody else have any announcements that we need to know? I always look to Darius and Lamar. <laughs> well, uh, the village is uh, gearing up for just a kind of a simple spring uh, enjoyment in the village and there's going to be a few things that will be posted uh, next week. Uh, there's going to be a car, a car club coming to town and, and some other things. We call it the spring attitude. <laughs> so, and so what's the date on that? It starts next weekend. Okay, so the first weekend in April. That's correct. Okay. And it continues throughout the entire month of April. Oh, okay. So, okay. So every weekend it's going to be something different. There will be different things that will be uh, posted um, by the beginning of the week. Okay. All right, so when those get posted, I'm guessing you're talking a historic Gold Hill. Th so I'll watch for that, and, and I will send that information out as I see it posted, and I'll put it on our Facebook page also. Um, okay, and is there anything else? Just as a point of interest, we have reached $450 in our collection towards the, for the pantry? Christian Worship Center as of today. Wow, that's great. I don't know if you all could hear that, but Bill just said that we, we've got $450 for our food pantry and our goal was $300. So y'all rock. Thank you very much. Um, and, and, you know, we, I, I'm thinking we almost really need to make that goal 400 right now because it's, it's just, there's such need. There's just such need. Our, the food pantry in Concord, they're adding hours because there's such need. They can't, they can't take care of everybody in those normal hours. So um, that's, that's great. Thank you, Gold Hill. Um, so I'm, I'm looking to make sure I don't leave anything out. Okay, so I will move on to prayer request. Do we, we're so glad. Answer prayer. Josh stayed safe this week, and he's here, so he'll be leaving again. So we've got to pray next week to make sure he stays safe and gets back. Are there other prayer requests this morning? David is still homesick. He was up through the night for several hours, and I think he's probably is he online yet? I think I think he said he would he he would visit us remotely. So um, just keep keep David in your prayers. Um, Lindsay has an appointment this week, and we hope that this appointment is going to give us um, a plan. We're hoping that this that that we will find out what's going to be done and when it'll be done, and and of course I'll keep you all updated on that. Are there any other prayer requests? Carolyn's on. She said that she misses everybody. Aw, <laughs> did you hear Chloe? She said Carolyn is watching, and she said I miss everybody. So I think everybody needs to holler. Hello, Carolyn. We miss you too. <laughs> <laughs> Are there other uh, prayer requests? All righty, praise reports. Besides Josh being safe this week, we've got one more week to go. 
I will give a praise report that Jared is not just asleep in bed. He is still working. We're just going to have to see. I think, I think Laura's probably going to be a Sunday morning widow for a while until Jared gets a little more time under his belt and can, you know, demand a better schedule. That's what happens when you get a new job. You have to work when they tell you to work. But he is, he's loving his, he, he called me Wednesday and uh, he says he, that he's just really, really enjoying working for Amazon so um, we'll just we, we'll just pray that that that, that he, he gets his deliveries done safely and gets back home because I hear I hear it's kind of rough that they don't don't they rush you I mean you have to do so many packages and certain amount of time and so when you see your UPS guy come running up and throwing your package at the door that's why because because they're going to lose their job if they don't get 400 packages delivered in a day so um, I'm learning a lot about delivery but we're just we, we that is a praise we're just glad that he's he did uh, get settled into this job we just miss him on Sunday mornings okay if there are no other announcements let's oh, I do have another announcement at the end of service I promise you three minutes but after Heather plays her postlude if you just all would just sit back down just for a minute um, I would not ask you to do this if it were not important but just a minute okay that's my last announcement now let's go to Jesus if you are able will you please stand and join me in the call to worship <laughs> Day by day, God leads us to the deep pools of peace, to the lush lawns of grace. Day by day, Jesus calls us to pour out ourselves in service, to anoint the stranger with hope. Day by day, the Holy Spirit shows us the community we could be and the family we are called to become. Our gospel reading today is from chapter 3, and I will be reading verses 16 and 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And if you would open your hymn books to page 365. <clears throat>
God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and he sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <clears throat> to God in prayer. Loving Father, we thank you for this world that you created for us to enjoy, for the beautiful creations, the birds and the trees, the rivers and the rocks, the oceans and the mountains. Only in the mind of a majestic God could all of these things have been conceived and then created. So we thank you, Lord, for being such a holy, holy, majestic God that loves your creation and has been loving it for thousands of years. And, and we, your people, who are broken and frail and faulty and selfish and not always even close to being holy. But you love us anyway. And you have poured out such marvelous grace on us. You have covered us in blessings that we don't even realize at times because we're just walking through the blessings and we're always thinking about something else. So Father, help us to be ever mindful of the goodness and the grace and the forgiveness and the blessings and the beauty that you have given to us each and every day. Just as the couple adopts a child that they did not conceive, you adopted all of us into your family. And we know that your ultimate plan is for all of mankind to come back to you, to come back to your heart and to love you and to say yes to our salvation. A salvation that we could not obtain on our own. A salvation that only your perfect son could obtain for us. And sometimes, God, we just are not grateful enough for that. Sometimes, God, we just walk around and, and it's just like I am a Christian and therefore I will make it. And, and we walk around just putting on that cloak of, of I am a Christian 
and, and, I, and I'm not Buddhist or Muslim or any of those other things. I, I am a child of God, but God, we don't act like your children sometimes. Help us to live up to the honor of calling you Abba Father. Help us to be worthy of the salvation from your son who hung and bled and sweated on that cross so that you never have to live without us, so that we know there is something better on the horizon than this life we are living today. But God, as we are living this life today, we ask that in addition to the forgiveness that you so freely give to us, that when we ask for forgiveness, Lord, help us to truly do a 180 and repent from whatever that was we needed to be forgiven for. Help us, God, to walk as a child of God, as a forgiven and saved child of yours, and with our eyes open, help us to see the opportunities that you place in front of us to be more like Jesus. Help us to not walk around just with the scarf of Christianity around our neck. Help us to not just put our cross on and, and, and let people know we belong to you. Let people see you in us. Lord, draw us nearer to you. Give us the desire to desire you more than we desire our next breath of air. And help us to, to become more holy. Help us as we work out our salvation to move towards holiness so that we will have eternal life with you, knowing that it is so much better even in, than, than this beautiful world you've created for us, that there's something better yet to come. Father, we do ask for forgiveness when, when we sin against you, when we sin against one another. We ask for forgiveness when, when we do not take an opportunity you lay before us to be Jesus to someone. We ask forgiveness, Lord, for the omissions, the sin of omission that we commit way too often. We ask you, Lord, to lift up and put your healing hand on Carolyn and on David and Graham and my sweet Lindsay. We thank you so much that Debbie was able to come back and join us today after her long sickness. That is a praise report, Father. We ask that you be with our shut-ins, the, the, the brothers and sisters that we love so much and miss seeing in our pews. Help Shirley and Archie and Glenna and John know that they are missed and that we love them and help them to feel your presence so that they do not feel so lonely. Lord, we have so many praises we lift up to you. We have so many requests that we put into your, your incense bowls at the foot of your throne. We each have individual prayers, God, that we cannot, we cannot speak, not to the pastor and not to the congregation. We have prayers that we can only share with you. So, Father, right now, hear our prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Father, we, we come to you in this place, and we ask that you anoint each and every heart in here. I ask that you bless every family that is represented. I ask that you bring comfort and healing to all that hear my voice today. And for those that could not get to a church, we thank you, God, for technology and TV so that everyone has an opportunity to hear the Word of God today. 
And so now we pray all these things and give them to you as you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. <coughs> 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 But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now as forgiven and reconciled people, if Bill will come forward, uh, let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God. And as you give your gift to God for kingdom building, give a gift of peace to someone near you with some words of kindness. <clears throat> from our heart, that you will bless them to glorify your kingdom in this world and in this community and in this church. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, amen. <clears throat> you may be seated. I do not usually keep this ugly purple bottle on my pulpit, but um, forgive me. I, I, I may need it before it's over. Will you pray with me and for me? Holy God, let the words of our mouths and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Salvation. Born again. I've been saved. We've all heard it. We've all said it throughout our life. And depending on who is delivering the message about salvation or being born again, uh, that someone is, is either trying to dig us out of the depths of hell and they're screaming and shouting and pounding on their pulpit. You've all seen that preacher that does that. Or, or the person that's delivering the salvation method, it can be a message that when we leave, we feel that we have truly been in the presence of God and the love of God. And we've truly been and seen the face of Jesus. We, the same message, depending on who delivers it, can either scare the bejeebers out of you or it can give you great peace. I hope today will be the latter. The church should always be delivering love and peace from God. The Methodist Church believes that God loves us so much 
that he is going to pursue us to the very bitter end. Remember that thief on the cross? In Gold Hill, we tell our story because we understand what a wretch we are. We get it. We see ourselves every day. We look in the mirror. We look and we think about what we're thinking about. And then most of the time, hopefully, we think something else and do something better. But it's only by God's grace that we even get to wake up another day with another chance to do better than we did yesterday. Yesterday. The abstract noun, here's the, here's the teaching part of me, that, that abstract noun word salvation, the title Savior and uh, saved and various forms of the verb, they appear, and no, I did not count them, I'm taking the word of my, my uh, commentaries here, but they, it appears over a hundred times in Old and New Testament. So that tells me it's a big deal. And, and so we, we can and by this number and by reading the scriptures and passages in, in the Old and New Testament, <clears throat> we can understand the importance of the doctrine of salvation. This major theme is found in our scriptures and it is called soteriology and that is a term that is compounded by two Greek words. Sortieria meaning salvation and ology is the Greek word logos that means the word. That's all the teaching I'm going to do today. So this noun salvation it denotes different things. It is salvation but, but it tells us it, there's other words that, that, that it also means if you get your Greek dictionary out and look it up. And, and I expect all of y'all to do that when you get home today. But it also denotes deliverance and pr preservation and safety. And I think those are great words to think about when we're thinking about our salvation. It, it's, it, it, it might happen in a minute, in a second, and it usually does. But it, it's got to be preserved. It's got to be ongoing. It's got to be a forever lifetime commitment. Sometimes this word is used to describe in, in the scriptures deliverance from physical danger and death. The same word that we're using when we say we're born again Christians. It, 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 it was used when the Israelites were being pursued by the Egyptians and, and Moses, he kept telling the people in Exodus chapter 14, he says, fear not and stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. We don't think about salvation in the Old Testament because when we think about salvation, we think about Jesus dying on the cross. God was already thinking about our salvation. And then, and then Moses has the miraculous deliverance of the children of Israel from the impending death at the hands of the Pharaoh. And so the chapter concludes with the words, Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hands of the Egyptians. And when Peter began to sink, he cried out to the Lord, Save me! Yeah, he was doing okay as long as he's looking at Jesus. But when he looked at his feet, he started sinking. And he says, save me. Those were his first words. And salvation, both in Peter's words and what Moses was saying that God had told him, both of these words meant deliverance from physical danger and or death. And this is exactly how the Apostle James used it in, in chapter 5 when he said, in the prayer of the faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And, and you know, I just assume we all believe that because we keep coming back here. We keep getting prayers out of the prayer box and praying for them. We keep praying for our precious Carolyn. We, we laid hands on Hobby and we saw that miracle. We got Debbie sitting out here that's been gone for so long because she couldn't even walk and she walked on her own two feet in here. We see answers to prayers every day. And that's what James is reminding us while we're praying. The prayer of faith. You have to pray in faith. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. <clears throat> you can be sick in other ways. 
besides a cold like bronchitis like I've had for three weeks. You can be sick in other ways besides needing a knee replacement. You can be sick and doomed to eternal death. Salvation is, is the moment that we are reconciled with God and we are rescued from destruction. And that is the greatest blessing that we could ever ask from God. If you notice today on the worship table, today's theme is the doctrine of salvation. And we are blessed people because we have a God that loves us enough to provide a way of salvation. This is greater and much more life-changing rescue than the Israelites out of Egypt or pulling Peter up out of the ocean. And we have to always remember and understand God's motivation is love. No matter what you're going through, His motivation is love. And His goal is to make all of us a family again, to have a right relationship with Him. And I mean everybody. And I'm going to go a little off track, but, but I've got friends that are my Muslim. I've got a friend that believes in Buddha. I don't get it. But I know God created these people and they want he wants them back. I've got two neighbors that are Mormon. And, and their theology is a little different than Protestant or Catholic theology. And I pray for them because God wants us all back as a family. And this is, this is what he's calling us to do. First, first he chases after us. And then we have that moment. We have that moment where we, we, we hear his voice and we say yes. And, 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 and when we do, we have to take the blinders and filters off of our eyes. And no longer can we look at people by the color of their skin. No longer can we look at people by where they were born and, and how they were raised. And no longer can we look at people as, as they've thrown their life away. Or, or no longer can we look at people as, as with their sexual identity. We are family. And we have to all love one another because we are all broken. We are broken and none of us have reached that holiness yet. So God, his goal is to make us all a family again. And if you don't hear anything else, please remember that when you leave here today. And, and to be a family, for me and, and Kinzer to be family, me and Kinzer got to have the right relationship with God. Because I did not give birth to him, and his mom is not going to give him up to me. So we got to have the right relationship with God for us to truly be family. Does that make sense? I hope. But you see, there's a little problem. Those dang trees, that apple tree in the garden, we just keep picking the fruit off the wrong tree. We are disobedient, and because of our disobedience, we are left in a disrupted relationship with God. And that relationship will eventually lead to death, and that was never God's plan. This obstacle between us and God. So God is always going before us and chopping down apple trees so that we will not get distracted and we can keep our eyes on Him. So how can we be rescued and have reconciliation with God? <clears throat> the first thing we have to realize is there's nothing we can do to be rescued and reconciled. And so Jesus steps in. You see, we, we were invited, just, just imagine this, we were invited into God's house for dinner. He had, he had put this beautiful banquet out in front of us. I mean, the most delicious of delicious foods. Problem is, when we walked in and sat down, we forgot all of our southern manners that our moms and grandmas taught us. We didn't wipe our feet before we walked in. And, and we, did, we, we didn't put our napkin on our lap like we were taught. We, we didn't wait for the blessing. We didn't wait to be served. We just started digging in. And instead of passing your plate to the right till it gets around and everybody gets a chance to get something, when the food got to us, we just put it in front of us so that we could dig in and get seconds as soon as possible. It was a mess. 
It was a mess. The dinner was a disaster. We were breaking stuff, knocking stuff over. Food was falling on the floor. And nobody was enjoying themselves. And so finally, people got up and everyone left. And then it was too late. We realized we'd messed up. And, 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 and we wanted to make it up to our friend Jesus. We wanted to make it up to God. We wanted to make it right. We wanted a do-over. Problem is, none of us can cook. I can't cook what was laid on that table. So I can't, I can't even invite God back to my house and let me put the banquet out. I can't cook that dinner that he put before me on the banquet table. So in steps Jesus to do what I can't do. I messed up. I disobeyed. I forgot my manners. But I didn't have anything to offer to God, my friend, who had invited me over to begin with to make it better. So Jesus came, and he offered a sacrifice to God on our behalf. Jesus came and went into the kitchen, and he cooked a new feast, and he invited everybody back. And this time, I remembered my manners. And this time, there was grace. And this time, when I said, I'm sorry, how can I make this better? Jesus said, just believe in me. Just stick with me. I'll get you through it. Once and for all, Jesus sacrificed himself to pay the penalty of our terrible manners. And he took the punishment. Jesus solves this rupture between God and us for good. In Isaiah 53, I just want to read a few verses because Isaiah tells us about this suffering servant that God has told Isaiah about. And he writes these words. He was despised and he was rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. And in verse 5, he says he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. And finally in verse 11, <clears throat> he said, writes, after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and will be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. <clears throat> John Wesley, I hope you all know his name by now. John Wesley was drawing on that relationship between this suffering servant in Isaiah 53 and Christ. And he reveals that at Calvary, the Lamb of God bore those punishments. And, and, and because of that, our peace and our reconciliation can be purchased by Jesus. Whether he's in the kitchen cooking a new banquet that we can't cook because we don't know the recipe, or he's hanging on the cross. It's always about us with Jesus. It's always about us. But now how do you get from sinner to saint? Well, let me tell you, my friend. If anybody tells you you can do that, you can tell them your preacher told them that they're telling a story and they don't really understand what they're talking about. Because the only way that you can get from where you are today as a sinner to a saint is that moment that Jesus takes your hand and in the holiness of that crossover brings you in to eternal life with him where it's going to be beautiful and there will be no more sins. You see, as long as we're living in this world, we're going to sin because we're tempted. Satan is, 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 he is on the run. He is after every one of us and, 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 and he, as much and as hard as Satan is coming after us, there's good news. There's good news. We all know we call this book the good news sometimes because it is full of good news. Because the good news that I have for you this morning, my friends, not only is Satan trying to grab hold of you by the neck, but God is chasing you also. 
He's chasing us because we are dumber than turkeys and stupider than sheep. And we keep straying from that safety net of our shepherd. And our shepherd is a good, good shepherd. And he loves us and he wants us forever. In the Methodist Church, we call this chase provenient grace and it begins at birth and that's why we baptize infants to begin that covenant but even without the baptism of an infant or a baby or a child even without that baptism the Holy Spirit is still chasing us down the game of tag began when we took our first breath out of our mother's womb and God never stops playing tag with us Wesley penned it, and, and, and we, we called this game of tag provenient grace. It is foundational in Wesley's theology. Provenient grace is seen by Wesley as the essential gracious gift of God to fallen humanity, that is us, revealed in Scripture and rooted in and reflected upon the Christian tradition. And that is, that, that is the grace, the blessings that we have every day. Provenient grace can be described as the work of the Holy Spirit. This is the vision that I love. This Holy Spirit starts blowing around us when we take that first breath of air. I'm not sure that first breath did, did not come from the Holy Spirit. Because that's when God starts chasing us. He starts protecting us and loving us at that moment. <coughs> And the Holy Spirit spends the rest of our life chasing us and showering upon us, mostly unaware, but it's part of the chase. And God has been loving and chasing us all of our lives, and it didn't matter if we knew it or not. He was there, and he knew he was there. Wesley said that uh, the, the, the provenient grace is, is part of this trinity. He says it is the drawing of us to the Father and to the light of the Son and the work of the Spirit convicting us in sin. Salvation is supernatural, divine work enabled by the grace of God. In reference to salvation, provenient grace is when we first wish. Now remember, you got this life before you knew the name of Jesus or before you knew how much Jesus loved you. And then, and then you had this moment and suddenly your sole wish is to please God. And, and, and that, is, that is where provenient grace has done its job and and we see that first dawn of light con concerning the will of God not our will and 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 we have that first um, first little transient conviction of I'm a sinner and I sinned against this man that loved me so much. He just, Wesley describes this, this uh, process of grace in the four steps. Being awakened by the provenient grace, convicting grace at that movement, and it takes us towards this desire to repent. And, and, and when we want to repent of our at that moment, when, when we desire Jesus more than we desire the life we've been living, that is when provenient grace has done its job, and now justifying grace takes over. Because we're repenting and we're turning around, and it allows us to trust Jesus for our salvation. And, and that salvation from the power and root of sin is restoration. Has anyone ever had to be restored before? I have. Over and over. And that restoration is in the image of God. That's what we believe, my friends. Wesley asserted all experience as well as Scripture shows this salvation to be both instantaneous and gradual. It's going to happen the instant that you first see Jesus. But friends, you're going to be repenting over and over. You're going to get justified over and over. And every time you get justified, God's going to come along behind you and sanctify you. He's going to clean you up, as my mom said, clean you up inside and out.
Paul tells us in Romans 5, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So I have tried to paint this um, very not well. I've tried to paint this salvation dis disrupted experience on the front of the bulletin this morning. And if you look at the top left, you see that we, right now, today, we are in the middle of a disrupted relationship. And that disruption is caused by sin. And that sin is going to lead to death. But we don't have to fear. We don't have to fear because God's chasing us. He's still playing tag with us. And this is where the hope of prevenient grace is playing out, right here. This is where the fork in the road begins. We have alienated ourselves from God with human faults and sinful selves, and we fell victim to the, church, to the clutches of evil and death. And that's not where God wants us. God is loving us with His grace. He is chasing us with His love. And we don't take any steps in darkness without Him chasing us to rescue us and bring about reconciliation. Rescue and reconciliation. The fork in the road, death or rescue. But because of our sins, because I don't know how to cook or I don't know how to pay reparations for my bad manners at dinner, there's still not anything that we can do, but God's still chasing us with His grace. And He knows that just because we want to be rescued, we can't do it ourselves. So He sends Jesus. And Jesus went to the cross for us and He died for us and He rose from the dead. And that death doesn't have to be ever in our future. I, I, I heard, um, uh, oh gosh, one of my favorite pastors, the name just left me on the way here. But he was talking about you're never too old to, to do better. You're never too old to, to get the best part of life. And he says because, Max Licata, that's who it was. He says because, because the best part of life is not on this earth. And so if you, if you look at this, then we, we repent and we believe and, and we never, ever die. We have cemeteries full of caskets that are full of bones. There is no one in that cemetery. Jesus went to the cross for us and died for us. He left the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit stays near us and with us until we hear that voice of Christ. And then we feel His love. And at that very moment, we have that choice to make. Choose life or choose death. Choose darkness or choose light. If we choose light, justifying grace through the power of faith is a gift that is immediately given to us, not because we did anything wonderful and not because we put money in the offering plate. It comes because we said yes. We said yes right here. It comes and it leads us to a new birth. The Holy Spirit gets to work sanctifying us. Sanctifying grace is infused in us by the Holy Spirit into the soul to heal sin and to cleanse us. Sanctifying grace makes us pleasing to God. Not anything we've ever done or ever will do. Jesus tells us, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the light, and nobody comes to my Father except through me. In John 3, 16, we read, God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. We read that this morning. God didn't send His Son here to condemn us. He sent us here to love us, to teach us, to, to open the portal so we can get to heaven with Him. That we might be saved through the blood of Christ. That, that we might not be running from the Egyptians through the desert, and we might not be trying to walk on water like Peter, but we need rescue and just the same. We are broken and frail and faulty creatures, and God knows it and loves us anyway, and He never stops playing tag with us. I know some people have lost people they loved, and... They've maybe had question 
about their salvation? Has anybody ever had a friend or loved one to die and you wonder, does that person know Jesus? Or better yet, does Jesus know that person? Well, let's not forget the thief at the cross. I kind of don't think he was a religious dude. I kind of don't think he was walking the way with the disciples. I kind of don't think that thief maybe even knew who Jesus was till they were all hung up there together. But Jesus told him, today you'll be with me in paradise. This morning I want to share with you a real life thief on the cross story with you. I have a friend who lives in South Carolina. And she was driving one night and it was dark. It was one of those dark, dark nights. Not a lot of street lights. And she missed a curve in the road. And while her car was spinning out of control, and she was certain she was going to die. She knew she was going to die. And that car came to a stop, finally, at a telephone pole. And when she was rescued, they, she was told that telephone pole was sitting right on her head. It was not resting on her head, but it was on her head. No weight, but it was touching her head. She said that while that car was spinning... That life went into slow motion, just like in the movies. And she said, she explained to me, you all have heard me talk about my daddy's visit to me in my dream about the difference in time in heaven and, and on earth. And if you haven't heard that story, I'll be more than happy to share it to you. But she says, she told me, she says, there really is a time warp between here and there. She said that time warp gave her enough time not only to see her whole life, not only to, to remember and see what had happened, it gave her time to pray. And pray she did. She said it was like, like I was um, once in heaven... Like I had told her one time, she said, it was just like when you said that time in heaven is different than time on earth. She said, I believe that that instant between life and eternity, because she had just experienced it, she said, I believe I was on heaven's time, the time you were talking about. She said, it, 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 it just was so weird. There's so much happened in just that instant. And she said, and while I believe that God's wrath is real and heaven is real, I believe that God is more merciful than we can ever fathom. And he slowed time down so that the sinner had a moment to speak with her Lord. She says, we know that his word says that it is not his will that any of us should perish. She said, I think he gives us that final chance to be with Christ. I think that's better than the thief on the cross. And so I hope that if you've got anyone that you're wondering about, just remember God put them in a time warp. And he took the thief at the cross why would he not take his child that has lived and maybe possibly influenced so many people? My friends, this is grace. This is why the Holy Spirit hooks up with us and, and is on our side and chases us all through our life. And like the thief on the cross, it is never too late to be justified and sanctified and to be born again and to be saved. Salvation is a rescue plan. Doctrines don't have to be complicated. I know if you, if you look inside here, you're, you're seeing I'm, I'm, I'm preaching seven different doctrines through, through, the, through the, the season of Lent. That's just a fancy word for something that's true. 
It doesn't have to be complicated. A doctrine just has to be true. And the truth is found in Timothy in the second chapter, verse 5. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and us. And that mediator's name is Jesus Christ because he gave himself as a ransom for us all. Amen. If you are able, the altar is open. If you are able, will you please stand and join us on page 378? And we are going to sing. Hang on, I've got it marked. We are going to sing the first three verses and then the last verse. So one, two, three, and six. <clears throat> of one majestic, miraculous, and gracious God. Go today in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost and be at peace. Amen.